Question. If somebody asks you to give an overview of the Old Testament, kind of a big picture outline, how do you think you'd do? You think you could do that? Could you give the main historical events? Let's say you started at creation. We just read about the fall. Could you give the main historical events and the sequence in which they occurred? You know, I thought about it, that in relation to America, and I thought, could I do that? And, of course, the first place I went, I thought, Columbus in 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. You know, and he hit a bump, skinned his rump, landed in the city dump. Anyway, that was, that was the little boy version of that. But anyway, sorry, I need to get down to preaching, don't I? Uh, anyhow, so that was Columbus. And the next thing I thought about, I thought the pilgrims in the Mayflower in 1620. And then I thought about July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. And right after that, of course, was the Revolutionary War. And just because it was soon after, maybe the War of 1812, you know, that was. And then the Civil War, World Wars I and II, well, you get the picture, kind of trying to put those in order, the big events. And that's our nation, that's America. Well, the Old Testament is about a nation. Of course, it's about the nation Israel, a great deal of it. So, so could you do that? Could you start at creation and go through the history of, old, of, the, of uh, Israel? I remember I was about 40. I think I'd been a believer maybe 10 years or so. And a friend of mine took a Saturday, and he went through something called Walk Through the Bible. It's a seminar you could go to. It's a one-day deal, and they teach you hand motions and sayings where you can start at the beginning of the Bible and basically walk through the whole Bible to understand the flow of the Bible. And I remember talking to him after that, and he could do that. And he showed me some of that, and I thought, I wish I had done that. I wish I could do that. So by that time, like I said, I'd been a believer about 10 years. I had a little bit of a handle on the New Testament, and I'd studied some books in the Old Testament. But once I got the children of Israel into the Promised Land, things kind of got fuzzy. You know, it was kind of like this cloud, and it was this fog, and I couldn't figure out how it all fit together. You know, what about Israel? I thought, whatever happened to Israel? How, how did they go from being a great kingdom under Kings David and King Solomon to being under Roman rule in Jesus' day. Whatever happened to Israel? So as I thought about that, I thought if we can understand what happened to Israel, that'll give us a real head start, a foundation on, be, on being able to outline and understand. It'll, it'll give us a context for the Old Testament. And you go, well, why do I care about that? Well, we, obviously we care about it because it's God's Word. And when we think of the Old Testament, there especially, it gives us a better understanding of God's character. There we see many of his attributes. We see, among other things, his holiness. We see his sovereignty, his judgment. We see his mercy and his grace. And that's not the only place, but we see it there a great deal. And obviously, the Bible's the book of faith and practice for us. So we need to understand it. And, of course, the Old Testament testament is a big portion of that so what we're going to do this morning we're going to look at two chapters that are key in answering this question i've posed whatever happened to israel but first let's take a minute and let's pray bow your heads father thank you for your word that you give us your truth lord that you move in time and space and history so as we spend this time this morning lord i pray that i would magnify you that it would mature your people, that you would use it for kingdom purposes. Lord, at the end of this time, I pray we would not just know more, but that we would love you more and be more like your son, Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So do this. Turn, take your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to be looking at chapters 11 and 12, and what we're going to see there is Israel is going to go from the penthouse to being well on their way to the outhouse. Now, these chapters are historical narrative. They tell a story from, from start to finish through these two chapters. So here's what I'm going to do. They're a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to take the time to read through these, Bibles for, the, through these, these two chapters first. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to read the Bible out loud in church, okay? And we all know that. But it's more than we typically do. It's going to take about 10 minutes. I'm going to try to read it pretty quickly. So listen up, and then we're going to come back through it, and we're going to um, talk through it, okay? Now, as we do that, should be a slide come up here just a second behind me. I want to give you a framework for what we're going to read. 
we're going to read about three kings, two kingdoms, and one God. Keep that in mind. Three kings, two kingdoms, and one God. Keep that in mind as we read through this. All right, let me see if I remember my code. Because I'm kind of nervous and I could forget it, and, and I'm old too. Okay, here we go. First Kings chapter 11. It says, Now Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations which concerning uh, which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, and on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and I will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, for the sake of David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. And the Lord raised up an adversary. Well, let me skip verse, I tell you what, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip verses 14 through 25. Basically, those verses tell us that because of Solomon's disobedience, God himself raised up two adversaries against him. He raised up a fellow named Hadad the Edomite and Razan the son of Eliada. These, these people are both military enemies of Solomon, so we're going to skip over those. And then verse 26 it says, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zerida, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city of David his father. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that this young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found Jeroboam on the road. Now Ahijah was dressed himself, had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him, and he tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and will give you ten tribes. But he shall have one for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they've forsaken me, and they've worshipped Ashtaroth, and again names all the gods. He said, They've not walked in my ways, doing what's right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it to you, Jeroboam, ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I've chosen to put my name. And I will take you... You, Jeroboam, you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do what's right in my eyes by keeping my statues, statutes and my commandments as David did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, 
but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did and all his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was forty years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. Chapter 12. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he'd fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? The old men said to him, If you will be servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel of the old men that the old men gave him. And he took counsel with the young men who'd grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who've said to me, Lighten the yoke your father put on us? And the young men who'd grown up with him said, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but lighten it for us. Thus we shall say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. It says, And now whereas my father laid a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So now Jeroboam and all the people come back to Rehoboam the third day. And he said, when he said, come to me again. And the king answered the people harshly, forsaking the counsel the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I'll discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke to Ahijah the Shilonite, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor. And all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and they called him to the assembly, and they made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against, fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. Every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and went home again according to the word of the Lord. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there, and he went out from there, and he built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me, and they'll turn to Rehobo return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam the king took counsel, and he made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You've come to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan. Then this thing became a sin, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places, and he appointed priests from among all the people who were not the Levites. 
And Jeroboam appointed a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, the feast that was in Judah. And he offered, like the feast that was in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel. And he went up to the altar to make offerings. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. So, who are the three kings? Solomon, Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Exactly. And what are the two kingdoms? Judah and Israel, right? Also known as, Israel is known as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So, we look at this, and I think... You know, looking at these three kings who they oversaw the beginning of the end of Israel. And you look at them and you think, what can we learn from these guys? And I would say that big picture, what we learn is what not to do. Now, before we jump back into the text and start working our way through it, when we think about Solomon, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, it's wisdom. That's the first thing I thought about is wisdom. And the next thing I think about is his great wealth. You know, he had a reputation for being a great king. I think about the books in the Old Testament he wrote. I think about Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Uh, remember last week, Bob said he built the temple. He came after David, and he built the temple. And I also think that he was the son of the great King David that we've talked about. So in the point of all that is Solomon, he was the man. I mean, he had it all going on, didn't he? When he took over his rule of Israel, Israel was at the height of their power. But what we just read about in chapter 11, we see by this time the worm has turned. As a matter of fact, the heading of my translation, the ESV translation for chapter 11, it says, Solomon turns from the Lord. And it's a sad story. You know, I think all of us realize that fame and fortune or success as the world defines it, it's, it's hard for us to handle. And that was true for Solomon. You know, we look at him, and he went from having a heart that was wholly devoted to God one that was worshiping idols and he did that because he let his passions get the best of him he went from God to self to idols and it was a dramatic decline when we see about him and we're not going to look back in 1 Kings 10 because of time but it started really back there in 1 Kings 10 we see the first signs it says that, that he did things in direct defiance to the God of law the, the, the laws of God Way back in the days of Moses, right, he goes up on the mountain. God gives him the law. This is, this is eons before Solomon comes to power. But God had given Moses the law. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it had to, it, God told Moses, he said, these were laws specifically addressed to future kings of Israel because obviously God knew that was going to happen. He said the kings should not have many horses, and they particularly shouldn't have horses from Egypt. Solomon did all of that. He directly disobeyed God's command. This wisest man on the earth, this guy who was the principal writer of the book of wisdom, the principal writer of Proverbs. And as we read in the text, it said God had appeared to Solomon twice. He didn't just know of God, but he had had personal encounters with God. So let's look down at our text. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to look at the first eight verses in a little bit of detail here. And notice it says there, it says, Solomon loved many foreign women, forbidden women. And that line, Solomon clung to them in love. You know, he had, can you imagine he had 700 wives and he had 300 concubines. And I think about 1,000 women and I think, where did he find the time? You know, how is that going to work? And it says that the wives, it says they were princesses. That means they were of noble birth. You think some of those women were high maintenance? I mean, what a mess. And then verse 4, the sad verse, it says, When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. That's so very sad. I mean, he had done exactly what God had warned him not to do. He marries these forbidden women, and lo and behold, he starts to accommodate their worship. The verse of, of this passage says he, he builds high places. He wants to accommodate their worship. And then before he knows it, he's worshiping these false gods, these idols with him. 
and some of those gods just had terrible worship practices. You had Ashtoreth, who was the goddess of sex and fertility. And you can imagine what that worship was like. And you had Molech. We've probably heard of her of him before. That involved child sacrifice on this human sanctity of life or sanctity of human life Sunday. You know, and both of those gods, those worship practices go on in America today, don't they? Well, how did Solomon get there? How did, how did the wisest man on earth go from loving God to practicing idolatry consisting of orgies and child sacrifice? How did he fall away? And I would say he fell away the same way that we do today. You know, it has been well said that the longest journey begins with the first step. And I also like that saying, or that question, how do you eat a whale? And the answer is one bite at a time. And before long, you feel bloated and gross. And that's where Solomon was. He was bloated and he was gross because he had started accommodating sin bit by bit. You know, he didn't marry those thousand women all at once, did he? But it was bit by bit, one woman, then the next, and the next, and he followed his passions. So he ended up hanging around with those who hated God. He was, he had, and, he, and like the scripture says, he became like the company that he kept. That's exactly what happened to him. He said, just, just a little bit of sin, you know, just a little bit of disobedience. And we think back a few weeks ago, back in December, when John Majors preached on that last section of the book of James. Remember what he told us? He said that wandering from God is a choice. It doesn't just happen. It's something that we choose, even, even if we try not to think about it. It's still a choice that we have to make. And we decide that we're going to become more, comf more comfortable with sin in our life. We make, that, we make that choice. And we try to tell ourselves, you know, we try to rationalize it. We say, it's just a little thing, and, and God understands. And God does understand, but it's us. We're the ones who don't understand. So, contrary to his own proverb, Solomon didn't guard his heart, did he? Because he united himself with those who worshipped idols. And as Solomon's sin increased, his view of God had to change. As his sin increased, his God decreased. In studying for this passage, I, I ran across a quote I like it was from a Bible teacher. He said, I can choose my lifestyle and adjust my view of God accordingly or I can understand God rightly and adjust my lifestyle accordingly. And that's exactly true, isn't it? That's what Solomon did. You know, and then, and then one of the last things John told us, I like this. He said, from time to time, we need to assess our lifestyle. We need to assess our understanding of God. We need to do those things and see where we are. Well, look back at the text. Look at verse 4. Back at that same sad verse, it says, for when Solomon was old. And I think that's particularly sad. Here you've got a guy who had become old, and he was wandering. And, you know, we probably all know people like that, don't we? We probably all know people who profess to be believers, and they end up not finishing well because it's not that uncommon. So, like Solomon, we get older, and we think, I've run the race. It's time for me to kick my feet up. I want to relax. I want to take it easy. You know, let's eat, drink, and be merry. And I know at my age, I'm aware of that temptation. That is the thing that's true for me. Those, the, the point of what I'm saying is those of us who are older, you don't just coast into the finish line. We've got to be intentional to finish well. And so if you're like me, if you're one of those who are older, and you're here this morning, and you know spiritually you're not where you need to be, let me encourage you. It's not too late. You know, as long as you have breath, there's hope. It is not too late. No matter your age, you can start becoming the person that you want to be. God is a God of new beginnings. His word tells us his mercies are new every morning. And you can start with that today. And one of the ways I would encourage you to start, because you may be going, okay, how do I do that? Is start spending time regularly in his word. Do you do that now? When I say regularly, I mean five, six, seven days a week. Spend time in God's Word because there's nothing like the daily drip of the Word that will wash away sin and polish godliness. You know, it's the 15th of January. It's not too late. I've already talked about I hadn't read through the Bible back at that time at the beginning in, in my introduction. Have you ever done that? And if you hadn't done that, I encourage you to do that. 
pretty much almost all Bibles have in there a plan for how to read through the Bible in a year. So if you hadn't done that, I would encourage you to do that. And another thing, you're here this morning. Are you here pretty much every Sunday? Are you in church every Sunday? I think Bob talked about this a week or two ago. Or is it, is it only an extreme circumstance that keeps you from being here? Or is it pretty easy not to come? And then finally, are you, are you in a small group? Are you plugged in with God's people living life? All those things will help you finish well. And no matter how old you are, it'll help you walk with the Lord and help you stay plugged in with Him. Back to the text. Verses 9 through 13. Let's look at verse 9. It says that God was angry with Solomon. Actually, I think the word is outraged because Solomon had turned his heart from him. And now look at verse 11 because here we're going to see where God pronounces judgment. He says... Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, since you've been disobedient, and you've not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Then, that's the judgment, and then verses 12 and 13 immediately following, we see some of God's mercy following this judgment. He says, Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. 13, however, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I'll give you one tribe. I'll give one tribe to your son for the sake of David and for the sake of Jerusalem. So, first display of mercy, he says, I'm going to tear it out of your hand, but actually I'm going to wait until you die and I'm going to do it to your son. And then the second display, he says, I'm going to leave a tribe with him because I had promised that in the Davidic covenant to David. Remember, we looked at that last week in 1 Samuel 7. So, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave one tribe with him for the sake of Jerusalem. So, while this is a mercy towards Solomon, as a parent, Solomon had to be sad about this. It was kind of one of those good news, bad news things, right? He says, Dad, the consequences of your sin are going to fall heavily on your son. You know, and I hear that as a parent, and I think, do I have areas of permitted disobedience in my life that have consequences for my children? That's a good question for us as parents. Do I have areas of permitted disobedience, things I choose where I choose to disobey God, that the consequences are going to fall on my kids? You know, think about our kids. They're typically better students of us than we are of them, aren't they? You know, you've the little song about little eyes and little ears. They study us, they watch us, and they continue to do that as those eyes and ears grow. You know, they're more apt to do what we do, not just what we say. So don't be like Solomon. You know, don't allow God's gifts to us to dominate our affections and thereby have negative consequences on our children. Don't do that to your kids. Well, look back at the text again with me. Finish verse 13. Here's what's happened, those first two passages, 1 through 8 and 9 through 13. First, we saw Solomon turn away from the Lord to idols. And then 9 through 13, the Lord pronounces judgment upon him. And as I said, I skipped over verses 14 through 25, told you what happened there. Because of Solomon's disobedience, God starts to execute judgment against him. He raises up these two adversaries. And I want us to not miss this point. We skipped the verses, but let's don't miss this point. God is sovereign over all things, including our troubles. He's sovereign over all things, including our troubles. And while Solomon could choose his sin, he couldn't choose the consequences of his sin. We need to remember that. Now, look down at verse 26. We find another. We find a third adversary that God raises up against Solomon, and his name is Jeroboam. He's the son of Nebat, and Jeroboam happens to be our third king. Not our second king, but he's our third king. And we're going to see his kingship realized in uh, chapter 12. But right now, this passage introduces us to him. It says that Jeroboam, he was a guy, he was a natural leader. He was able. He was industrious. He'd helped Solomon manage some of the public works projects that Solomon was doing in Jerusalem. Said he helped him uh, close up the breach in the city wall in the Millo, which is not an Italian mill, okay? But that is a series of terraces that I had to look that up, obviously. A series of terraces they build on a hillside so they can build houses on the flat levels. That's what a Millo is. And, and uh, Jeroboam helped him in that. And then starting in verse 29, look there. God is going to give the prophecy, give a, the same prophecy to Jeroboam that he'd given to Solomon. And he does that through the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite. It says, Ahijah tells, uh, through Ahijah, God tells Jeroboam that he's going to take the kingdom away from Solomon's line, and he's going to give it 
to none other than Jeroboam. He's going to give it to him. And he says, so and here's how it happens. One day Jeroboam's outside Jerusalem. He's out in the countryside. And the prophet Ahijah finds him. And he told us that he, Ahijah's got on, he's sporting some new threads. He's got on this new garment. And he takes it off and he tears it into 12 pieces. And he uses this garment as an illustration of what God's going to do. He said, God's going to take 10 tribes away from Solomon's line and he's going to give them to you but he's going to leave one tribe with his son, with Solomon's son. And verse 36, look there with me. It says, Yet to his son, and speaking of Solomon's son, I will give one tribe that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I've chosen to put my name. Now, is it this remaining tribe, it's going to be a perpetual testimony to God's choice of David. And as we say all this, maybe you're like me. You may be sitting there going, wait a minute. Twelve tribes, ten tribes, one tribe. Well, let me explain. The, two, the one tribe that God's going to leave with David is actually going to be two tribes. Judah's the significant remaining tribe, but he's also going to leave with him the tribe of Benjamin. It's a, it's a small tribe. Judah, you, as you know, it was the tribe of David. It was the, where Jesus the, came through that line. He was known as the line of the tribe of Judah. But Benjamin's this small tribe. And if you had looked at a map at that time when Israel was still made up of the 12 tribes, you would see that the city of Jerusalem is right on the border between Judah and Benjamin. And the point of that is, as Judah and the city of Jerusalem goes, so goes the tribe of Benjamin. And they're going to stay faithful to, to, uh, to, Re to uh, King Rehoboam here in just a minute. So that's what happens to them. Well, look back at the text. Look at verse 37 with me. Ahijah goes on. He's given this prophecy to Jeroboam. And he says, Jeroboam, you're going to reign over all your soul desires. He says, you're going to be king over Israel, which is going to be known which that's what the ten tribes that are torn away they're now going to become known as Israel that's going to be the new the new Israel if you will and I say that because it can get a little confusing because when you talk about the nation of Israel it depends on where in history is it the 12 tribes or is it the 10 tribes the northern tribes will also be known as Israel uh, uh, Israel is also known as the 10 northern tribes so with that point hopefully made then uh, then God through Ahijah makes a covenant with Jeroboam just like he'd made with Solomon and here's what he says verse 38 look there he says Jeroboam if you'll listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what's right in my my eyes keeping my statutes my commandments as David my servant did he says I'll be with you and build you a sure house as I built for David I will give Israel to you so basically he says you walk with me you obey me and I'm going to establish the line of Jeroboam just as like I have established the Davidic line. I'm going to give all of Israel to you. And then just after that in 39 he says, you know, I've afflicted the house of David. He's, that's not going to go on forever though. And that's a nod toward the coming Messiah which is going to come. Jesus is going to come from the house of David. And so we wrap up this prophecy that God gave to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And then look down at verse 40. Evidently, Solomon hears about this, and I guess he thinks he's going to thwart God's prophecy. He's going to thwart the word of God by trying to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam flees. He goes out, and he hangs out in Egypt until Solomon dies. And then verses 41 through 43, as we come to the end of chapter 11, we're going to close the book on Solomon, the sad story of Solomon. It says he reigned over Israel 40 years, the same time as David reigned. And then there at the end of verse 40, 43, we see the lead into chapter 12. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Rehoboam is king number two. Well, we're going to begin chapter 12. And Jeroboam, who had been Solomon's adversary, now is going to become the adversary of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, our king number two. Now, obviously the Boam boys have similar names, all right? And it gets confusing pretty quickly. So, and, and let me just say, that even though they have similar names, they're not related. They're not brothers. They're not half-brothers. They're not anything like that. They just have similar names. And since they do, here's what I'm going to do. Think of Rehoboam. He's Solomon's son. He's the rightful heir. 
So sometimes I'm going to refer to him going forward as rightful Ray. That'll help us keep him straight, all right? Rightful Ray. Now, while I'm alliterating rightful Ray, I just want to say that we're going to see both the Bowen boys are boneheads, all right? So hang with me. What's going on in America this week? It's the inauguration, right? Friday's the inauguration of a new president, President-elect Trump. And that I say that because when we start Chapter 12, that's what's happening in Israel. Rehoboam, king number two, he's gone to Shechem. This is a place of historical significance in Israel. He goes there for the coronation, for his coronation as king. Well, Jeroboam, he's been hanging out in Egypt. He's been waiting for Solomon to die. Solomon dies, so he and all Israel, in other words, a whole bunch of people, leaders, dignitaries, they go to Shechem for the coronation. But we just need to know that a lot of them aren't there, including Jeroboam. While they're there for the festivities, that's not only, the only reason they're there. They want to come. They're there because there's already, there's been this historical deep divide between these ten northern tribes and the tribe of Judah. It goes way back in the history of Israel. And these ten northern tribes, along with Jeroboam, they want to use it, this coronation, as an opportunity to confront Rehoboam, the new incoming king. So that's what they do. They come, and if you'll look at verse 4, they come to Rehoboam, and it says, Your dad made our burden heavy. He put a bunch of taxes on us. Look, new king Rehoboam, king two, he says, if you will lighten our load, lighten our yoke, we'll serve you. Reasonable request. So, rightful Ray says, go away for three days. Give me time to think about it. And he goes to the old men for counsel, the guys who'd been around Solomon. And they tell him, they said, good idea. Be a public servant. Where you can compromise, lighten these people's load, make their taxes less. He said, if you will lead with humility, these people will serve you. They'll be faithful subjects. Well, rightful Ray's just stepping into power, feeling his oats, and he's going, I don't know about that. So he goes to his buddies. He goes to the young bucks who grew up with him. And they say effectively, no, 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 no. You need to tell those people who's boss. So you think it was tough under my dad Solomon. You ain't seen nothing yet. And that's just what he does. The people come back on the third day. Jeroboam's with them. And rightful Ray says effectively, Buddies, there's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Rehoboam. And they go. The people respond, as you can imagine. They think, that's well, not so much. Not so much. Look at, well, first, look back at verse 15, just a second. I, I don't want us to move on without making this point again. It says, talking about Rehoboam, so the king did not listen to the people, talking about the good counsel, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. All this was from God. All this was from God. Now, verses 16 through 24, look there. As I just said, as you can imagine, the people didn't like his answer, all right? They're not pleased with what they've just heard from their new leader. So what do they do? Basically, they say, there's nothing for us here. He said, you're on your own, house of David. We're out of here. And that great line, to your tents, O Israel. And it means, guys, let's go back to our tents. We're going to pack our stuff, and we're head home because we're done here. So, what happens? It says, verse 17, the people of Judah, and think parenthetically the tribe of Benjamin as well, they remain faithful to rightful Ray. He keeps rulership over them. But then there's this, I would say, less than, drama uh, less than brilliant diplomatic move in which rightful Ray sends a guy named Adoram, who just happens to be the secretary of the Department of Forced Labor. He sends them out to talk to these disaffected tribes, right? Not a smart thing to do. And what happens? They stone him to death. And so rightful Ray has to jump in his chariot, and he has to hightail it back to Jerusalem to save himself. Look at verse 19, kind of a summary verse there, a sad summary verse. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David until this day. When this book was written, Israel was still, the northern kingdom was still in rebellion against the house of David. 
And what do they do? They gather together, those ten northern tribes that have rebelled, the new Israel. They gather together, and they make Jeroboam our king number three. So now he's king number three. Rehoboam, he, one last desperate effort. He said, I'm going to keep this thing together by force. So he goes back to Jerusalem. He raises an army from Judah and Benjamin, 140,000 men. He's ready to, to attack Israel. And God sends word through the prophet Shammai, and he says, don't do that. Don't go fight against your relatives. You know, don't do a civil war thing. And this time, rightful Ray listens. And he says, okay, we're done. Disband the army. Everybody go home. And so it's done. That's it. The prophecy of the divided kingdom that God gave to both Solomon and Jeroboam is fulfilled. It's the, it's the realization of the sin of Solomon. It's a done deal. So, what do we learn from Rehoboam? We've talked about Solomon. What do we learn from Rehoboam? Well, just think about him. Because of his pride and because of his stubbornness, in three days... He destroyed a kingdom that had taken 120 years to build. He did that in only three days. It's the classic, I won the battle and I lost the war. Rehoboam's view of leadership was about power. It was about privilege. You know, it's been well said of Rehoboam, his rule was about him, not them. That's how Rehoboam viewed leadership. You know, we think about Solomon. Remember back in verse of uh, the first part of chapter 11 and what did he do he accommodated he compromised when he shouldn't have his son Rehoboam's just the opposite he won't accommodate and he won't compromise when he should have because this issue with the northern it wasn't a, the northern tribes it wasn't a truth issue it wasn't a sin issue if he could lighten his ta lighten their taxes he should have lightened their taxes but he didn't do that and my point is there's time when compromise and accommodation are a good thing but not when it's about truth but Rehoboam refused to do that. He, he wanted to lead in a way that was for his own good and glory, not the people's, and certainly not for God's glory. But God did end up using him for his purposes, didn't he? Just that arrogant, that foolish decision that, er that Rehoboam made, and it divided the kingdom of Israel. You know, we had seen that Solomon had sowed the seeds of decline, and now his son Rehoboam harvests that fruit of destruction. Well, think about, just look, step away from the text just for a minute, and think about what you know of the rest of the Old Testament. Think about modern history. Because when we do, we can see the rest of the story of the nation of Israel. Never again, never in the history of Israel, were they a mighty nation. Never again did, did they wholeheartedly follow the Lord, although that had been spotty certainly in their history. But think about the northern kingdom. From day one, they took a godless path. The people were never faithful to the Lord. They never had a godly king. This divide that we just witnessed, that we just saw here, it happened around 930, 931 B.C. By 722 B.C., the northern kingdom, Israel, the new Israel, under the judgment of God, they fall to the Assyrians, and the people are dispersed throughout the kingdom of Assyria, through the Assyrian Empire. They're gone. It's done. And then we think about Judah, the southern kingdom. Now, through Judah, the line of David was preserved as God had promised to David. He kept his promise. And while Judah had some good kings, their history was spotty. They had a lot more bad kings than they did good kings. And they lasted longer than Israel, the northern kingdom. But by 586 B.C., the Babylonians, they were a tool of God's judgment because of Israel's spiritual adultery. They ended up, they finished their conquest of Judah. They destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, and they deported the bulk of the remaining Jews to Babylon. Now, some of those people in 536 B.C., some, some of them come back to the land of Judah, some of those exiles return, but they returned as subjects of the Medo-Persian Empire. They had never, Israel was never again an independent nation. Not until the Israel we know today, not until it was reestablished in 1948 by the UN after World War II. So for a couple of thousand plus years, Israel ceased to exist. Well, on that happy note, 
Let's look at our third king. Let's look at Jeroboam. You know, I said at the beginning, maybe you remember, I said I wanted us to answer that question. I want us to clear up some of that fog about the Old Testament, the question of whatever happened to Israel. And as I got into this text, though, of course, we couldn't help but see the foolish sinfulness of these three guys, of Solomon, of Rehoboam, and Jeroboam. And I thought, you know, another title for this sermon could be Dumb and Dumber and Dumber Still. All right? Because you think Jeroboam would have gone to school on all that's gone on. You think he would have learned that God could be trusted. I mean, he'd seen this whole thing play out in front of him exactly like the prophet Ahijah told him. So what happens? So he's made the king of, of the northern empire. He's made the king of Israel. And he says, thanks, God. I got it from here. I think I can do this, all right? And King 3 springs into action. And I thought, why did he do that? And I think, why do I do that? Because we do that same thing ourselves, don't we, from time to time. But let's look back at our text. We're in chapter 12, verse 25. Jeroboam's the new king over the northern kingdom. He fortifies a couple of the cities. And now look at verse 26. He starts to think, and that's a dangerous thing for Jeroboam. He says, you know, thinking in his fleshly wisdom, he said, if these people continue to obey God and go down to Jerusalem, if they continue with this God-commanded practice of going down to the temple several times a year, their hearts may just turn away from me. They may turn back from right to rightful ray, and they may rise up and kill me because, you know, people are fickle. So I think I'm going to do something about that. And so what does he do about that? He institutes this replacement religion. Kind of smells like what they've been doing. Kind of feels like what they've been doing. But it's not what they've been doing. So what he does, he builds these two calves. Look at verse 28. He has these two golden calves made. And he puts one in the south of Israel. And he puts one in the north of Israel to make it easy for everybody. And there, and then he says, verse 28... Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That's almost exactly what the people said in Exodus 32 when Aaron made the golden calf. You know, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. All right, so he does that. So then he says, and you can just hear this coming out of, of his mouth as a politician. He says, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. He said, hey, that's in another country now. I'm your new king. I'm, I'm doing this all for you. It's going to be easier. It's going to be better. You don't need to go down there. That's too big a deal. Now, here's what he's not saying. Here's, but here's, here's what's between the lines of what he's not saying. Basically, he's saying, let's all ignore what God told us to do. His commands about how to approach him, they're just not that important. You know... I'm sure Jeroboam wasn't the first guy to do this, but this approach has worked for political and religious leaders ever since. We see it work today, don't we? You can ignore the truth if you appeal to and if you satisfy people's selfish instincts. You can do that. If you ignore the truth and appeal to their selfish instincts, you're going to gain a large following. And if you don't believe that, just look at people who preach the prosperity gospel today because that's what goes on there. Well, the rest of the chapter 12, I'll wrap that up. It says Jeroboam, he completes the establishment of this replacement religion. He has non-Levitical priests. He builds temples on the high places. And he even institutes a replacement feast for the Feast of Tabernacles that they had observed in the seventh month. He makes this bogus feast in the eighth month. So that, it's, again, it's going to feel like what they used to do. It's going to satisfy their religious urge. And in the last verse of chapter 12, it says, He himself sets the example during this bogus feast. He goes up to the altar and he worships in one of the new temples. Now, we don't want to go on from this without making this point, And that is, in the Old Testament, God was very, very specific about where and how the people were to approach him. But yet Jeroboam, for his own sake, for his own power, he corrupts virtually every aspect of the worship of God. 
you know, he said basically, we can approach God in the manner of our own choosing. And how much do we hear that today? It's up to us. We can decide how we want to go before God. But we know that God hasn't changed. There's one God, and there's one way to approach him. And today we know that way, and his name is Jesus. So Jeroboam, he thought he was smarter than God. He had it figured out. You know, he thought that while, while uh, Ahijah had made, or God through the prophet Ahijah, he made a, a covenant with Jeroboam, didn't he? He said basically the same thing that he had told Solomon. He said, hey, obey me. If you'll do that, I'm going to establish your line, and you'll be king over Israel. This is going to go good for you. But Jeroboam didn't trust God. He was afraid. He thought the people were going to turn away from him. So he totally disregarded God's promise and instruction. Now, my point of that is, today God calls us to do the same thing he called Jeroboam to do. He calls us to trust him. He calls us, us, calls us to walk with him. And even when we don't understand, or I would even say especially when we don't understand how God is going to fulfill his promises, how he's going to accomplish what he promised to do, we need to walk with him. We need to not be a Jeroboam. And as I thought about Jeroboam, I thought about the Virgin Mary. You know, think about the Virgin Mary. In the face of complete human impossibility, she obeyed God, and God used her to accomplish his redemptive purposes. And so I think it's fair to ask ourselves, are we more like Jeroboam? Are we more like the Virgin Mary? And I know for me, the answer is it depends. Well, we've come to the end of these two chapters, and they're very historically significant. You know, a lot of stuff has gone on. And remember I said at the beginning, I wanted to answer that question about whatever happened to Israel. And hopefully we've done that. But something else you may recall I said, back in the introduction, I said that the Old Testament especially tells us a lot about the character of God. And I think we've seen that today. We've seen his holiness in his specific commands to Solomon about how Solomon was to live before him. We've seen his sovereignty, how he orders and hu uses human events for his purposes. You know, we saw that with all three of the kings. And we saw his judgment on, on Solomon and the division of Israel. And then right after that, we saw his mercy, how he deferred that division until after Solomon was dead. And we also saw his grace in that in the midst of this judgment of the division of the kingdom, he preserved the line of David from whence will come Jesus. So now, let's talk about more grace. Remember our framework. Think back with me. What did we have? We had three kings two kingdoms and one God and we've been in the Old Testament where it tells us the Lord our God is one but we also see in the Old Testament as well in the New we see that he is the great three in one right he is the Father he's the Son he's the Holy Spirit so speaking of his grace in this act of grace that being complete undeserved favor of God toward us what does he do he sends his sinless son Jesus to come down and he lives a perfect life so he can be a satisfying sacrifice on the cross to make atonement for our sins. Jesus Christ on the cross paid the sin debt for everybody that would ever believe in him in the history of the world. And so what we want to do now is we want to remember the act of grace. We want to do that this morning and we do that when we come to the table. We remember that act of grace of what God did for us through Jesus the Son. So I've mentioned the great three in one. If, if God the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to this truth, then we want you to join us in communion. I say that we practice open communion here, and that's what I mean by that. Is if you are a follower of Christ, as you know him as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to join us at the table this morning. But I also want to add, if you are not, I just encourage you to stay in your seat. Scripture tells us that if you are not a follower of Christ and you participate in communion, it says you eat and drink judgment upon yourself because God knows our heart. You know, we're trying to be, if we do that, we're trying to be something we're not and, you, and you're trying to fool God. And you can't fool God. He knows. So 
it's really an act of mercy. Uh, we have people frequently that stay in their seats. Nobody's going to make you feel weird, okay? If you do that, I would encourage you to sit there and think about what you've heard this morning and what I've just said about Jesus. So the way we do communion here is we come down the outer aisles, you'll receive the elements, take them back to your seat, and then we'll all take them together. Once I prepare the table, I'll invite you up.
this morning we've been talking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they observed the Feast of Passover. And that night in which Jesus was betrayed, before that event occurred, he had gathered his disciples in an upper room to celebrate the Feast of Passover. And there what he did that night was he established a new chapter in redemptive history. He made a new covenant. And his disciples didn't know that at the time, but he told them, he said, uh, I want to have this, this Last Supper. I want to celebrate the Passover with you. And going forward, whenever you gather together and do this, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And effectively, again, something they didn't understand yet, but what he was telling them is, I don't want you to ever forget what happens tomorrow when I go to the cross. Don't ever forget. I want you to always remember. So when you come together, I want you to do this in remembrance of me because I've made a new covenant between God and man. So he took the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. And then likewise, he took the cup, and he says, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And now stand to receive a benediction, a blessing, a good word. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You're dismissed.